So I think we can start now and the people still coming on board can catch up later. So welcome. My name is Johan Terve. I'm VP Marketing at the Pilo Business Unit at the NIA. And with me as speakers here today, I have Ronan from our partner Fortinet. Ronan, would you please introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. Yes, Ayan, thank you very much for having me. My name is Ronan Spia, and I am the director for 5G Solutions Marketing at Fortinet. Thank you, Ronan. And we also have Jonas Björklund, who is my boss, heading up the Aptilo Business Unit, joining us as a speaker. Hello, Jonas. Hello, Joanne. Yeah, looking forward to this. Hello, everybody, and welcome on the webinar. Yeah, I'm Jonas Björklund. Uh, like uh, Johan mentioned, I'm heading up the Aptilo Business Unit uh, as, as part of INEA now. So looking forward to be presenting the, uh, the IoT Hyperscale to you all. Great. So, some some housekeeping for today uh, this is the agenda for today and i will start talking about what really is a hyperscale iot solution it's a quite new concept so everyone is probably not aware of that uh, one of the cornerstones in such a solution is actually iot security and then uh, ronan as an expert in that area uh, will will talk about that as section two and then at the very end, Jonas will dwell in a little bit on an overview over a service that we have uh, for adding a hyperscale uh, layer of, of IoT connectivity control and security as a service for mobile operators. So we want this webinar to be very interactive. So uh, after each section here, we will have a short poll and at the end we will have Q&A. And if you go in the bottom of your screen or, or the frame that you are in, uh, you will see a Q&A uh, uh, button that you can click. Here you can submit your questions uh, at any time. And if you want to be anonymous, that's perfectly fine. You just tick that box. And then we will answer as many questions as we have time in the very end. Um, uh, and if, if there are any left, we will, of course, uh, answer those through email. So let's go. I start off training a little bit on the poll. So here comes the first poll for you guys. Uh, we are really interested to learn our audience a little bit, learn to know our audience a little bit more. So please select any applicable uh, things here on, on what your business is. Great. Interesting. Give it a few more seconds. I don't think exactly everyone has participated yet. So please do. Okay. So uh, we ended there, I think. So let's share the result here. Uh, so yeah. We have a mixed audience, um, a lot of uh, vendors and, and colleagues in our business. That's fine and good. Uh, we have uh, connectivity service providers, of course, uh, and also analyst medias. So very welcome. And uh, let's get going with this webinar. Uh, before we do, though, I also want to say that we will send during the course of this week our brand new white paper to every one of you uh, as a appreciation for you to taking part of this uh, webinar. And also, we would like you to a favor in return. Please take one minute to answer three quick questions, and th that will pull up in your window after uh, the webinar has ended. Uh, and that helps us to be better next time. So please do fill in that um, survey afterwards. So let's get going. Um, what's in a hyperscale IoT solution is the first subject. 
Let's first start trying to answer that question by looking at what enterprises really need in terms of IoT connectivity. Of course, they need secure and seamless end-to-end -end connectivity, that's a given. But many of them also need the operators to help them to manage the security uh, so that they can get their own firewalls to, uh, to set their security settings, etc. They may also need a fully private connection with VPN uh, between the device and their, their uh, backend servers. Um, they need, of course, rapid deployment at low total cost. And they also need full control over all connections. So enterprise self-management is a very important part of this. And it's also important for operators in a, to be able to scale their business. And customers need to control things like VPN setup, firewall settings, traffic filtering, bandwidth and data usage uh, limitations, location and time of day policies, tailored policies to their specific use case, and also IP assignment and configuration. What's more, and actually uh, even more important, is that they need to have a unified uh, service across the globe. And we will come to that a little bit later, but uh, they need to keep things like IP addresses constant wherever uh, the, the device goes. Uh, which have a network they, they connect to. Um, and just to illustrate that a little bit, I can give you a quick example. Um, I love my car. It's the best car I have ever had. But uh, the problem is that the connectivity, and it's an uh, island problem, I realize, but the connectivity to the car uh, is not stable. So I cannot put up the uh, heat preheating uh, sometimes because the car just don't respond. And what's interesting is that if I start the car, immediately the app will, will get connection. So that could be a number of reasons. But one simple explanation for this failure is, in fact, that the car has changed its IP address. And if it does, obviously, uh, the app try, without telling this backend server that it has changed the IP address, obviously, the app will try to, to connect through the old IP address. So there are simple things like that that actually can create a lot of headache and rage, I would say, in different forums in the internet, which is not good for the car brand. So this is important stuff for sure. And customers also need predictable global connectivity with reasonable charges. And compared to traditional smartphone subscriber services, IoT is a completely different story. And why is that? Well, if we look at it, subscribers and thereby their, their mobile operators are local by nature. So there is one SIM card per, per subscription, uh, one tariff, one contract, and obviously one mobile operator. The service is normally handled by one subscriber during the lifetime of the service. And roaming is only when traveling. If we look at IoT connectivity, on the other hand, IoT product manufacturers are mostly global. So there are many SIMs, many tariffs, many contracts that they need to keep track on. And uh, if they don't have one mobile operator that can create, provide a global connectivity for them, there are many mobile operators also that they need to handle. And the device itself may be handled by many users along the value chain and during the course of its lifetime. And many times permanent rooming is required because obviously the, the, if you work in a global uh, uh, environment, you, you need to, to have uh, it working everywhere. But the problem is that it might be prohibited from regulations or from simple things like your partner MNOs don't allow it to have permanent roaming. So 
the um, the lifesaver here is really if you can, as a service provider, use eSIMs and then localize the eSIMs to the local country that they are going to work in. Then maybe the biggest uh, um, difference between, between subscriber services and IoT connectivity is that in the subscriber services, you have a handful of subscription types only. And the same thing with the policies that goes with them. There is the same policy and security settings per, per subscription type. And you really don't need to unify the, the settings internationally uh, when traveling. Uh, end user self-management of services are also very uh, standard. So the subscriber is actually handling the, the, the subscription uh, themselves. If we look at IoT though, service and policies are, needs to be tailored to each customer. You can almost say, see it as each customer is their own uh, uh, subscription type. And they need to be able to handle their own policies and securities from self-management portals. IoT services must be unified internationally as the example with the car manufacturer that I just gave. There is no such thing as you can have a different policy or a different IP address even in, at, at some times for different markets for the same device. And we really believe that mobile operators must rethink IoT and consider the two perspectives showing in this uh, diagram or matrix. If we look at the X axis first, you have the business value for customer, it can be low or high. And on the Y axis, we have profit for operators, which can be obviously low or high. And if you were to re just repackage a standard offering, you will be down in the lower left corner there. Uh, and most operators also add C management and private connections on top of this. And the key word here is really most. They will then deliver a commodity with little, very little value add for their customers. Those operators will only compete on price and the lowest bidder will easily replace them. So they are in what we call the churn zone, colored red in the matrix down at the lower left. In the left half of the matrix, operators will only be able to create a profitable IoT business if they become the market leader or price volume leader in their markets. The further you move towards the right, adding value added services, the stickier the customer become. And higher revenues comes with value added services such as analytics, managed security, global connectivity, and the ability to provide granular policy control. For most operators, the high profit will not follow when adding those value added services. And the reason is that they, they are stuck in what we call every customer is a project zone where they need to adapt their services for every customers. And it's not given that they, at least in the long term, will be able to take out those uh, uh, extra charges needed to, to have profitability. So we would argue to be really profitable with a volume IoT service, you really need to uh, go up to the uh, upper right corner in what we call the high profit zone. And to get there, you need a high level of auto customization, uh, automation, self-management, customer self-management, etc. And the question is, will operators current processes and mobile core take them there? To answer that question, we need to look at what mobile operators have today. And that makes me a little bit doubtful because their mobile cores are built for stability, not agility, let's face it. And it's nothing wrong with that. That is for a good reason. They also have, of course, IoT connectivity management platforms, 
that they help customers handle their, their SIM cards and, and connections, and also handle uh, th things like billing uh, or providing data for billing. Some of them also have the possibility to localize eSIMs, which is good. But we still think there is a missing layer here. And that is a layer that provides the flexibility and security that IoT connectivity services craves. This layer provides what we call adaptive agility with a high level of automation and customer self-management and also security services like uh, firewalling and uh, uh, providing secure connections to VPNs. And the best proof really that such layer is needed is to look what operators generally is providing today. If we look at this, we have found that most operators, there are always exceptions, of course, they either uh, um, provide a very basic service, standard offering with SIM management that can be instantly deployed, or they deliver exactly what the customer asked for. And then we are into the customization projects that can take months and to a high cost. But what about customers that are prepared to pay for value-added services, but not for tailor-made customization projects? Well, we certainly think that there is a new type of services coming that reveals the hidden mass market for IoT with a high degree of customer self-service, auto-customization, global connectivity, managed security, granular policies, VPNs, analytics, and more. And that can be instantly deployed and tailored to the customer at a low cost. And what we really propose is uh, you really need to go there in order to, to uh, come to the high profit zone. And what we then suggest is that operators add um, hyperscale uh, programmable layer of IoT connectivity uh, control and security on top of what they already have. And then they can get those uh, value added services instantly deployed at a low cost. And since many, operate, uh, many customers have similar customizations requests, they can easily move a lot of customers from the customization projects bracket to the new service. And this is what we call a hyperscale IoT connectivity uh, solution. And let's see on the layers on that after we have first looked at some vertical examples, because with this, you can really uh, address the whole market from utilities that have basic services, need for basic services, over a number of different verticals to the large automotive, for instance, uh, that may need uh, customization projects that are tailored just for them. And this kind of service that we have in the middle prov provides more time for you to do better customization projects. And to address the, uh, the huge market of small, medium enterprises, you really need that level of optimization. So the hyperscale IoT connectivity solution basically have uh, four layers. You have the operator's own network, you have your global mobile operator partner networks, either as bilateral uh, agreements or through connectivity hubs. And then you have the programmable IT connectivity control that I just spoke about. And very, very much important also customer self-management on top of that and connectivity management platforms. Now, the good thing is that you don't have to invent this yourself because you can select the NEAP Tilo IoT CCS uh, service to provide that programmable IoT connectivity control and security. And Jonas will dwell into that uh, in, at the very end. 
So what is the business case of a hyperscale approach? Well, uh, this is a, a research that uh, has been done by, by Transforma Insight Sites, which is an analyst firm. And they concluded that if customers, enterprise customers, select an uh, operator that has a hyperscale IoT connectivity service, they can save on average the equivalent of 28% of the total cost of global IoT connectivity. And that equates to an astonishing 117 billion US dollars the next 10 years. And as you can see in the details here, most of the savings comes from directly or indirectly from the third layer of pro programmable IoT connectivity control and security. And if you look at our uh, white paper, there will be a look a link in that to that uh, research so we don't have to dwell into that in any more depth right now so a uh, short poll here uh, before i leave over to ronan for the security section so i launch a poll with two uh, questions that i would like you to answer So the first question is, do you see a need for keeping IP address, uh, security settings and policy, et cetera, consistent across international networks? Uh, in the next, I, it's a tricky one maybe, but I want you to select two of the greatest challenges that you think uh, facing IoT connectivity providers. And I think uh, I give it a few more seconds before I close the poll. Poll. Okay, so I, I think I end the poll now and share the results. Let's see here. So, yeah, um, a vast majority think it's somewhat important or absolutely critical. That's good news for, for us. Thank you for that. I, I like that um, because that is what the hyperscale IoT connectivity solution can provide. And the greatest challenges, well, price erosion, of course, and security is uh, very high ranking. That is uh, interesting. And also operational efficiency. Good. Very interesting stuff. Thank you very much. So with that, I will leave over to Ronan and I will just make sure that he gets into in control here. Uh, let me see here. We go on until you give me control. I, I give you control I think, now. Yeah. Yeah, I think I have control. Thank you. So, so hello everybody. So, I think, you know, the last uh, poll is very, very interesting, and it's not surprising. You know, security was the number one concern and challenge that, um, you know, IoT connectivity providers have, and um, you know, we all get and 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 many research so that from an enterprise perspective, from demand perspective, you know, security is a major challenge. Is actually deploying more and more you know, IoT and industrial IoT type of, of devices. So definitely security is, is, is a major issue. So um, I don't have a lot of time. So what I want to talk about is two things. Uh, I want to talk about, um, you know, the, the demand and supply, right? Because, um, you know, we know that providing just mass IoT connect, and when I say IoT, by the way, I mean IoT, industrial IoT, I, I will just refer to IoT. Um, when providing just, you know, massive scale, IoT connectivity, it's very important, but then the margins are very low, as, as, as mentioned by Johan. And, you know, you want to provide more value. You want to provide more value because you want to be more, um, you know, you have a, want to have a, a, you know, a, a, a sticky relationship with your customers. You want to provide value. And that, of course, also means for you revenue and growth. 
um, as a service providers. And it also means that you know, you're answering a real need from coming from, from enterprises. So, so let's look at, at, at really what is, is there a real need? I mean, we, I've, we've seen that there are very few enterprises, if any, in the audience. Uh, but is there a real need for enterprises when it comes to IoT security, cellular IoT connect security? And um, I think there is. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to share with you a recent survey that was uh, done by Tripwire. And that was um, done in March, 2021. So this is very, very recent. And they asked uh, over, they had uh, over 300 respondent and they focused on North America and EMEA and Europe, European market. And I wanna share with you four, four questions and the results that they've asked. Um, and um, you know, the first one is you know, how concerned you are about you know, deploying these devices and the security risks that they, they represent. And not surprisingly, you know, 95% mentioned that are either very concerned or somewhat concerned that actually deploying these will actually bring, will create some security risk. And that is that is normal, right? That is expected, that is completely valid because it is true and I will talk a bit um, about some of these um, afterwards. So there is a real concern and this is a real, um, you know, a factor that holds uh, the deployment of, of these IoT devices. The second question, that is very interesting. You know, what is the challenge? So there are risks. So what are the challenges that you're facing actually providing security or securing these IoT and, uh, devices? And there are, there are several, there are many. And, and we see that a lot of them are, you know, quite heavy um, on the mind of these people. Um, but I want, I want to focus on several of them just to give you an idea. So, you know, a simple th uh, uh, thing might be tracking inventory. So knowing what I have connected, this seems absurd, right? If I'm an enterprise and I don't know what is connected to my network, what is not connected to my network. And this is not only for cellular connectivity, this also applies for you know, IoT devices connected to my ethernet physically. So there's really a problem here. And then you know, how do I know that there is something wrong, that there is um, you know, a vulnerability, that there is you know, an attack, and how do I remediate these attacks, right? And then how does, you know, the introduction of IoT devices, where do I stand from compliance perspective? Am I compliant? Am I not compliant? Can I provide compliancy taking into account these devices? These Are these devices the security that I have in place, the policies that I have in place, the, the strategies that I have in place, are they valid for IoT connected devices? Very good questions and a lot of uncertainty. And these are real challenges for enterprise customers. Two last questions. Which of the following statements best represent your personal security philosophy? So these are people that actually have the responsibility to deal with IoT security in their enterprises, right? And it's very interesting. 78% believe that you know, security for IoT requires a different approach to what their enterprise as an IT environment or as an industrial environment have in place, right? So it's not very easy that you just take what you have in place today and just extend it to IoT and IoT security. It's a real challenge and things have to be a bit different. And the last question is if it will ever pick up exactly. In your opinion, do you have the right resources? Do you have the know-how? Do you have the people? Do you have the knowledge to actually deal with IoT and IoT security across the company? 88% said, you know, either no or yes, we do, but we need some help. Okay. So I, I use these, uh, this report to show you that there is from the demand perspective, there's a real need for a secure IoT connectivity service, right? Going beyond security, which means that for, for the service uh, uh, provider community, um, this can be a real, um, a real driver for competitiveness, for revenue, for growth, right? But it can only be done 
if it is done in a way that it is um, efficient, agile, and automated. That because of the scale of it, and because the fact that you know every customer is a bit different, right? And this is the beauty of the joint solution, the Optilo IoT CCS deploying, you know, the Fortinet solution. Um, inherently in its solutions to provide that managed security on top of the IoT connectivity. Now, when we talk about security, uh, you know, we have, we have to understand that when we talk about IoT, we're talking about an ecosystem. We're not talking about, you know, IoT devices that are just, you know, floating there, connected to the network and, and just living in a world of their own, right? There's an ecosystem where we have the IoT devices, we have their cellular connectivity. It can be NB-IoT, it can be LTE-M, it can be 5G, 4G, whatever. And it connects it to a brain. And that brain is an IoT platform that is used to gather the information, store it, analyze it, um, you know, uh, provide it to third-party applications, and also take decisions that then are being um, communicated back to the IoT devices in certain um, cases for them to take a specific action, for example. Right, so when we think about security threat, we need to think about that entire ecosystem, right? So if we look specifically about the platform itself, the IoT platform can be provided. It's it's really it's 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 a mix of interconnected applications that can be provided by the mobile operator. They can be done by the enterprise, by a third party, by hyperscalers, and so on and so forth. And there will usually be some sort of a mix of of, of these. And then we have, of course, you know, the threats that are targeting um, you know, vulnerabilities within the IoT platform. And I won't go into detail, but of course, yeah, this we're talking about software. In many cases, you know, web type of software. So, you know, um, exploit in this platform. Um, many of these platforms actually communicate in between the different components using API, right? So API is another. Um, area which needs to be or can be exploited for attacks um, by, by, by cyber criminals. So it needs to be secured. Um, we have fuzzing attacks. We, of course, have denial of service uh, um, attacks uh, that can also be, by the way, devices that are misconfigured. There's an update to a, to a device or to a set of devices. Here we can talk about thousands and millions of devices and something went wrong, right? And that creates a denial of service type of attack involuntarily, right? And of course, also attacks that are hidden in encrypted traffic, which is very important. So the fact that something is encrypted shouldn't be um, a block to actually be able to provide security or be able to identify that this is bad and it needs to be secure and protected against. Now, looking at the devices, the IoT device side, here again, there are multiple uh, type of, of threats that we can, we can think about. Uh, we have to understand that these IoT devices, you know, there are, you know, the consumer ones are very limited in their capability, uh, capacity to actually deploy any type of security, and even the industrial ones are relatively um, limited. Um, and you know, there are in places that sometimes are not protected, or uh, places that we have, we are humans are will visit um, and and take care of once every. 10 years or 20 years and, and so on and so forth. So they're very vulnerable also physically. And here we have, you know, IoT specific malwares, you know, uh, um, exploit because these devices still use specific hardware or specific software that has vulnerability that can be exploited. Um, you know, the use of these devices to uh, launch denial of service attacks, um, and then misuse of the devices, for example, actually taking the device actually and using it somewhere else or for a different purpose and so on and so forth. So when we think about the threats, we're thinking about the two sides and behold, the thing that actually connects the two sides is the cellular network, right? So adding security at that portion of the network just makes sense, okay? It just makes sense. And it makes sense and it's a win-win situation. It's a win-win situation for the enterprise to be able to say, oh, now I can manage my IoT connectivity, but I can also add security as I see fit. And of course, from the service provider, it means, oh, that's great. I can provide that value, that revenue, that grade, that, that, that growth, that competitive edge um, that, that is enabled now. Um, the damage can be, of course, 
very significant. And here we have to understand, this is one of the main uh, differences between IT and IoT, that the damage can be physical. It can manifest itself in a physical manner, right? It can alter the functionality of the device, right? The device needs to do several things in a, separ in, in, in a, in a specific manner. It can actually change um, the functionality of the device. It can actually physically destroy the device. It can, for example, um, create a situation where the device has battery that should last for 20 years, but um, they're actually out in, 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 in a month or half a year, and, 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 and that's a real problem. Or even if we had these examples of actually changing operational limits of IoT devices creates physical damage to the devices themselves and put them out of service. So uh, that can have very significant um, implications. Um, the use of the devices you know, to launch attacks, uh, we've seen the Mirai um, attack uh, where um, devices were put into um, uh, the botnet, uh, over 2 million devices that were used to launch attacks and so on and so forth, right? And by the way, these also can have a major impact on the cellular network itself. So there's a real damage and there's really need um, to provide security. Um, now, how do you provide security? What are the building blocks in providing security? I think there are two building blocks. The first one is visibility, right? And visibility into two things, visibility to the devices and the applications and visibility into the data, right? So what, which are the connected devices? No. Which application they're using, uh, where they're allowed to go, where they're not allowed to go, what is their normal behavior, what is not a normal behavior, what protocols they're using, um, what they should use, what they shouldn't use, uh, what is the normal behavior of a protocol, what is not the normal behavior of a protocol. And again, the fact that you're using, for example, encryption, IPsec tunnels, does not, should not, must not impair your capability to understand these details and to have that visibility because you can only protect when you have visibility, when you know what's happening. When you know what's happening, you can identify threats. You can identify uh, you know, suspicious behavior. You can mitigate these type of um, you know, behaviors and, and attacks, right? So this is extremely important. Another thing we have to understand that you know, we have multiple of attacks that are available there is no one magic solution. So there is no one magic technology um, that, that is out there, for example, IP reputation, that if I use, then I solve everything. No, you have, there's a multiple uh, uh, mechanism that have to be put in place in order to actually allow you that flexibility to be able to uh, mitigate, to discover and mitigate and protect against these type of threats, which are valid in, an IoT ecosystem, right? And the beauty of um, the joint solution and Petillo and Fortinet is that they have these capabilities, um, um, very agile, very automated, self-managed by, by the customer. And with that, Jonas, I think, um, I'm sorry, Johan, I think we have um, some questions for the audience. A poll we have actually. Uh, so um, I will, I will uh, pull up that poll now. Uh, and uh, there are three questions in this particular poll. So I launch it now. Do you think enterprises in general are, are aware of all their company connected IT devices is the first question. And then we have the next question. Uh, to what extent do you think companies currently implement security, visibility, and control for their IoT connected devices? And then we have the third question. Do you think that operators should offer IT security? And it's three questions, so I will uh, 
let you answer a little bit more before we show the result. So I think we can end the poll there and let's have a look at the result here. It's very exciting. So 11% actually think that companies generally don't have check on, on their connected devices. That's interesting. Maybe you should comment on this instead since it's your section. Yeah. Well, I think I think I think this is in line, and I think that the the you know the, the people participating in this array are are spot on. I mean, I'm 78% assume that uh, think that you know enterprises might not be aware uh, of all or, or or are not aware of the majority. And I think this is this is right. I had meetings with with enterprises, large enterprises that um, where they said we don't know what we have connected either physically into our network or wirelessly into our network. This is a real problem. So um, that shows you some uh, uh, of, of the problem, some of the scope of, of, of that problem. The second question, you know, the implementation of security visibility and control for IoT. Um, again, um, the majority says of you say that they do not Implement any specific IoT security, and I think this is true. I think there's a uh, um, and, and and the IoT security that is implemented is mostly for the physically connected IoT devices, so devices that are connected to their Ethernet, to their network physically. Um, and um, I'm definitely, I think, when it comes to I, to cellular IoT connectivity, there is very little um, there is very little security actually implemented. And and and, and as we've seen in, in in the survey that I presented. Some of the reasons why, right? Because because this is new. Because they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the understanding, they don't have the resource to be able um, to do so. And some of uh, because this is relatively new, some of the policies and strategies that they have in place just do not fit that type of of of, of connectivity. Right. And then the last one. Well, for, for the sake of time, I think we need to speed up a little bit. So I take the third. It's very interesting to see and very. Encouraging for us, I would say that seven to eight percent think that mobile operators always should offer uh, security services. Now, I certainly hope that it's not a correlation between mobile operators and no, that's not their job. But I don't believe so. So uh, th that that was very positive and interesting to see. Thank you for that. Now I think we need to move over to our last speaker here, uh, Jonas Björklund, the floor is yours. Thank you, Johan, excellent. I will continue into the next section, our final section, and talk about uh, what it is in all this that Aptilo and Nia Aptilo uh, is doing. And I'll circle back to, to this slide that, that Joanne showed before, the four layers that, that you can identify, main layers of a hyperscale IoT connectivity solution from, from the bottom of where you see the mobile operator's own networks or the, the infrastructure and all of, all of the things that are in that, to the, to the roaming footprint, um, partner networks for uh, also for eSIM localization and local SIM cards for IoT purposes. And then there in the middle, the programmable IoT connectivity control where you find uh, our solution. Uh, and then we expect, of course, on top of that, a collected uh, user uh, customer self-management uh, APIs for the customers, the enterprise customers to integrate with. Uh, so I'm going to talk about specifically our component and the programmable IoT connectivity control layer very quickly uh, and explain to you what it is. So uh, as you have understood, we partnered with Fortinet and we have deployed uh, in, in the public cloud uh, using AWS public cloud infrastructure, uh, the Aptilo uh, AAA and policy functionality. So that is the brain of the solution. That's where we uh, orchestrate and keep control of what's going on. And then we are tightly integrated with the Fortinet Fortinet equipment in order to, to deliver this solution. And we deliver this as a service uh, operated and managed by the NEA Aptilo team. 
Uh, and if you want to follow the traffic and signaling that goes through the solution, you find the mobile core there on the left hand side. Uh, so that's that's uh, either the, the, you know, the physical uh, mobile network in, in a specific country, in a specific region, or it's a hosted uh, core uh, you know, with connectivity across the globe. Anyway, you will find there the packet gateways where the traffic is exiting and where uh, signaling control functionality is also going to our solution. Uh, and with that integrated to our solution, that's, that's quite easy typically for, for a mobile operator integrator. It, it, uh, a mobile operator, it looks like we would be an enterprise with a large uh, APM, basically, a large enterprise with its own APM. We can take the traffic and then uh, with a multi-tenant solution, deliver it to uh, a multitude of enterprises, you know, uh, in an automated fashion. So enterprises gets to decide would they like the traffic to go to the internet protected by a firewall, uh, as you can see uh, going upwards in the picture, or would the enterprises would like to have traffic delivered to them securely in VPN tunnels, one or multiple. It could also be a combination thereof. You have some destinations, some, some traffic that you would like to have from the IoT device to the internet uh, because you have some services there, uh, but it could also be uh, you know, then you have specific destinations on your on your you know, on your own public cloud infrastructure in your hosting center where you have deployed IoT applications. So this really enables the enterprise to to get it their way in terms of how the IoT traffic is delivered. And then on top of that, they have control over IoT security that was clearly explained here by by Ron and the the importance and challenges of that. So with this, the operator can bring to the enterprises a layer of security uh, to identify threats on the network and to block any unwanted traffic uh, uh, from IoT devices or from internet or from servers going to the IoT uh, device. Uh, um, and then apart from, from the own mobile core, you can also get in partner networks or global connectivity providers in order to make this a global IoT service uh, with, with one point of control. Uh, so I, I'm going to give you one, one clear example on, on how we can help and, and, and where automation comes in and really helps. So I'm going to compare uh, uh, imagining setting up uh, on the mobile uh, core network uh, a separate uh, APN, a separate section on my network with a VPN. Uh, basically, sales would ask to schedule a VPN setup typically. Uh, and uh, you know, get in contact with, with operations if this is not automated, I should say. Uh, and then it will of course depend on how, how busy uh, is the, the MNO operations team, you know, ranging from ready to go, free, uh, some busy or very busy. And, and obviously, you know, this request will be in waiting mode for, for, for a few weeks, uh, in the worst case, many weeks before, uh, before this, initiative or this, this operation is started of adding a VPN. Uh, best case, it goes smoothly, no problem. It will take some time and then return to the customer. And, and hopefully if they get it right the first time, typically there is a back and forth with an enterprise customer. If they don't have the tool to self-manage and troubleshoot themselves, it's going to be back and forth. So at least a few weeks is, I, I know, is, is what we have seen from, from customers and our experience with, is what it would take when you don't have the customer you know, in charge of setting up and troubleshooting themselves. And then of course, there could be normal cases and could be really troublesome cases where you end up waiting even months for this process to, to complete. And, and we've seen with our customers that you know, that remains the same for a little bit. Uh, and then the customer, the enterprise would like, you know, to add the service or they, they, they move their system or they add another application layer uh, and it starts again. Whereas with uh, the Aptilo Connectivity Control Service, the CCS, it's instant. It's enterprise customer self-administration. So it's literally a fraction of a second before the VPN is up. And if there are any changes to the configuration, it's up to the enterprises to, to do that at their own will. So 
apart from the added functionality and features that, that, that are there, it's also all this cost and time saving, both for the operator and for, for the operator's customers, the enterprise. Um, uh, this is an innovative solution. So that's been recognized in the industry. Uh, it's been uh, uh, awarded uh, on a number of occasions. The, the, the latest one was the World Communication Awards just uh, a month or so ago, where, where we were awarded for, for a IoT, Indian IoT innovation category uh, with a very nice uh, um, motivation as well from the jury. I think spot on explaining why uh, why this is an innovative service and, and really you know there to help IoT connectivity providers uh, uh, with the real problems that they have. Okay, I think that concludes my se section, and we have room for some questions and answers. Yes, uh, let's then uh, select. A few. Uh, here comes one from Nuno Con Calves. Sorry for not being able to pronounce your after last name correctly. Yes. <laughs> um, hi, which protocol is supported by the solution? That's for for you, I guess, Jonas. Yeah. Uh, many different protocols. So there, there are obviously protocols for integration points from CCS to the mobile operator and to the, uh, uh, and to the enterprise. So, so that's, that's one topic. And there are several, several APIs, most of them REST-based. Um, I think it might refer to what protocols we can, we can filter and we can control on, on the traffic layer. So that could be a question to Ronan. Uh, yeah. That's really where, I mean, a strength of our solution is we, we, we do have the, the, the full next generation firewall from Fortinet that, that helps us doing all this. So anything basically the Fortinet's uh, FortiGate product supports, this solution will also support. So we had, just to be very brief, we have a very wide uh, support of uh, IoT protocols, industrial IoT protocols, um, IoT manufacturers. Um, and this is very important because there are known vulnerabilities in this equipment, this manufacturer. So it's a mix of all of that together that enable us to provide that type of, of, of security. So there's a, I wouldn't list the protocols, but you can find that information very easily on Fortinet and we can provide the answer in more details afterwards. Yeah. Great, here is another question that is anonymous. Uh, will this hyperscale IoT connectivity concept be relevant also in 5G? What do you say, Jonas? Absolutely. I, uh, that, okay. Uh, yes. Uh, the same. I mean, IoT is is going to be one of the big drivers for for the five G rollout, and really, that's what the big growth of number of devices in future five G network is expected to be. And and in five G, uh, you definitely expect the same need, obviously, for uh, multi tenant capabilities in in the IoT connectivity, so that. Uh, an enterprise customer, you know, they want to control their own destiny. What sort of traffic are they, are they delivered to them? What, what sort of security features would they like to have enabled? I think uh, the network slicing concept in 5G is really an extension of what we're doing into the network. So you can, uh, you can easily see how, uh, you know, with the 5G standalone core, you have traffic coming in uh, from your own network slice. Uh, it comes into uh, into the standalone core and, and is then forwarded to uh, to our CCS solution, where the enterprise controls, like they would do today in a 4G network, what happens to the IoT traffic, uh, and and so it, in a way it plugs nicely into into 5G. Also, with the distributed core that is expected to be more common in in, in 5G, not this big centralized core that that we typically see in 4G. You need. It's very good that we have this uh, small entity that we deploy in the public cloud that can follow and be close to to the places where where uh, the five G core is is being deployed. So um, yeah, the, it it should should have a perfect fit for that. Great, great, thank you. Here is another question: How does your business model look? Well, uh, I can answer very shortly on that. Uh, 
First of all, it's a uh, service uh, that is dedicated per mobile operator, you could say, or per IoT connectivity service provider. Uh, so, so it's not the multi-tenancy on AVS, it's, it's a single tenancy. And since it's a service, it's totally OPEX. And we have a pay-as-you-grow model, which means that uh, we charge basically per, per uh, uh, device uh, and month uh, and, and uh, a few other parameters. So it's a pay-as-you-grow model. Okay. Um, here is a tricky question. Do you see a big difference in security requirements for consumer and businesses? Uh, I don't know. That's probably for you, you, uh, um, Ronan. Yeah. So, so first of all, one big difference I think is that the consumer will probably won't be willing to pay for securing. He's not probably not even aware of that. So when I have my connected devices at home, uh, which are connected wirelessly, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, security is not really an issue. Where probably I would be very limited in how much I'm willing to pay. Now. Enterprises, however, for example, enterprise that actually provides services to this type of, of, of consumer IoT would definitely want to consider security because what it means is, because remember, he provides the, the platform side, backend side of these services. So he definitely wants to protect himself and such a service can be part of the solution. Plus it is in interest in, 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 in its interest to actually offer that as a service or a, a revenue generating service or something that will actually uh, be uh, positioning him as, 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 uh, 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 you know, as a differentiator. Of course, when it comes to industrial enterprises, we actually use uh, these connected IoT devices to run their operations. So this is very critical for them. Of course, security is 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 major, and they're willing to pay for that. They're willing to, um, if they get the right service, they got the right SLA, they will pay for it. So that's that's the big difference. So I think that when we're talking about security services um, to um, cellular IoT, it's always targeting the business, the enterprise, whether it's an enterprise that is serving um, consumers IoT or whether these are enterprises that use industrial IoT in their in their business in their operations. Thank you, Ronan. Here is another question. Is your solution replacing Ericsson IoT Accelerator? Well, that, that is the easiest question today, so I can take that. No, definitely not. <laughs> uh, look, we most of our customers is actually using Ericsson IoT Accelerator. So it's a, they work totally in concert with each other. Complementing, I would say, for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, I think we need to wrap up there. And if there are any remaining questions, we will uh, certainly uh, uh, answer those to, to the individual that, that uh, asked them. So with that, uh, we would like to thank you very much for participating and giving us an hour of your valuable time. And uh, stay tuned for the next few days. Uh, we will send you our white paper that we hope you will enjoy. Uh, and don't forget now to answer the poll, uh, not poll, the, the, uh, the survey about how you found this webinar afterwards. We would appreciate it. And it takes one minute of your time. So with that, thank you very much for participating and have a good day or night, whatever it is in your area.